Hi folks, um, most of you know me, I'm Marcus Hardy. This is the results of my PhD, um, which I did at the University Farm, looking at water movement and soil water storage within the duplex soils or the texture contrast soils. Our traditional understanding of soil water movement follows the principles or laws of Darcy's Law or Richard's Equation in which you get uniform infiltration through a soil resulting in sharp wetting fronts. Um, these models and these concepts of soil water movement assume that the soil is always uniform, that things like soil swelling and water repellents simply don't exist, and that structures and voids are uniform and evenly distributed through the soil. And that infiltration largely results from capillary, the soil sucking, the absorption of water through the soil profile. And these are the assumptions and models on which all soil water models and groundwater models are based, whether we're talking about things like Absom, um, Kabbalah, um, Dairy Mod, Hydrus, Macro, any of these models, they all assume Richard's equation is the primary engine for driving soil water movement. So what are the soil texture contrast soils? Essentially, the duplex or texture contrast soils have one and a half texture groups coarser or more sandy topsoils than the subsoils and they have a, a clear to sharp boundary between horizons. So typically you get sands or sandy loams sitting above a medium clay. And the key feature in terms of their hydrology is this discontinuity between the A and B horizons that you suddenly go from a sand to a clay that you can see here. The texture contrast soils are widely distributed. They account for about 17% of the Australian land mass and 80% of agricultural regions in southern Australia. They are one of our most important agricultural soils in Australia. And yet we understand very little of their hydrology. Even in Tasmania, you'll see the dominant agricultural areas are underlaid by the texture contrast soils, particularly the curasols in the south and the southeast and the chromosols in the central regions of Tasmania. And if you think about the new irrigation developments that are occurring around the state, we're looking at this southeast area and this Midlands area. You know, these are highly relevant soils for both our existing and future agricultural production in Tasmania. We typically understand these soils to develop ponding and subsurface lateral flow between those A and B horizons. And using these models which assume uniform flow, we'll see that rainfall in one area will cause these downslope slugs of soil water through the landscape. And this is, this is commonly the extent of our understanding of the hydrology of these soils. But what happens if your texture contrast soils look more like this, with these really prominent clay columns and sand infills every... 30 to 60 centimetres. Do we reasonably expect these models and understandings of soil hydrology to apply? So the focus of my thesis has really been to undermine 150 years of hydrological research by demonstrating that these concepts of soil water movement are simply not valid in these soils. So we're trying to understand how rainfall and irrigation actually infiltrate into these soils how water is redistributed and where and how it's um, stored, looking specifically at the relationship between soil morphology and the hydrological processes. It, and that, uh, that's sort of it's starting to occur internationally under a new paradigm called hydropedology, which integrates both pedology, the understanding of soil morphology, hydrology, how water moves through soil, and then catchment hydrology. Firstly, I need to describe what is preferential flow, because I use the term quite a bit. Preferential flow is essentially any soil water process in which water moves faster and deeper through the soil profile than it should. Okay, so it totally disobeys the laws of Richard's equation and Darcy's law. Okay, and here's three examples from my site. Here's macropore flow. This is flow down an ant nest. You can see the die tracer. Here's funnel flow, literally in the shape of a funnel in this case, and that's where lithos 
This is ferric boundaries influence the direction and concentration of flow and finger flow, which results primarily from water repellents. I established four sites at the university farm. These three were on alluvial quaternary alluvial fan deposits and the fourth one at site D were on tertiary sediments. They were deliberately selected to be very close to one another to show the short short scale differences in the hydraulic properties of these soils. You can see that their morphology differs remarkably despite being essentially the same soil type. Notice the thick A2 development and sand infills at this site, the complete absence of an A2 and no sand infills at this site and intergrades at site A and C. These soils are hydrologically very complex. The top soils are hydrophobic, they're water repellent. The A2s are cemented with silica, which also proved to be related to water content. There's a hydraulic discontinuity we've spoken about between the sand and the clay. We have deep sand infills through the profile, and the subsoils shrink, swell, and are dispersive. So I presented some of this work at a conference, Hydropodology Conference in Germany, in which it was commented that this is probably the most hydrologically complex soil to ever be reported in the literature. The surface of them. So if you think of how rainfall infiltrates through a soil, it doesn't come through a cut profile, it hits layers. You can see we have this grading between this one with a constant B horizon. Notice the cultivation time marks here. Right through to these distinct columns here, the sand infills going all the way down to 60 or 70 centimetres. And these other two with these cracks and deep infills between clay columns as well. Their chemistry also differed. Site A, at the bottom of the hill, was alkaline. The other three were acid. All of them were sodic. And the level of salt, which indicates the extent of leaching through the profile, differed remarkably between the one with the sand columns and some of the ones without, the ones at the bottom of the profile. Get on a bit of methodology. One of the principal methods I used was dye tracer. This is the rainfall simulator applying 25 millimetres dye tracer to the soil. I then excavated a trench beside the dye area, um, built this shade tent over the whole area, and then excavated in a series of horizontal sequences down through the profile and vertically through the profile. And this is the type of result. Here's site B. And we can see we have nothing like what Richard's equation is predicting. We do not have infil even infiltration through the A horizon. These two are 20 centimetres apart from each other this way. Most of the A horizon stayed, very little. It's a high degree of spatial variability. We've got infiltration all the way down to a metre in this soil. We've got bits that are completely missed out. We've got funnels, we've got all sorts of things. Highly complex and highly non um, non-compliant. That same soil, five metres away, once I wet the soil up and then applied the same amount of dye, you can see that the dye didn't even infiltrate into the A2 this time. Clay columns have gone, they've shrunk, they've swelled up and disappeared. We've got this unstable flow, unstable wetting front in the A horizon. Well, a few things going on there. Where's the dye gone? Same thing site D. So this is a site without the A2. Different patterns in the dye but essentially the same consequence. And again, when it's wet, you can see that the clay's all swelled up and there's no infiltration beyond the top of the A horizon. So what's going on? What are the processes? They're predominantly preferential flow, as you'd suspect. So in the top of the A horizon, we get this unstable flow or finger flow due to water repellents. We get lateral flow on the top of this A2, within the A2, and then we get movement down the sand infills. But the most interesting one we get is we get this rivulet flow, these little trickles running down the cracks between the clay columns, hitting the bottom of it and then actually back filling back up the soil profile like filling a bathtub. So these soils saturate from the bottom up, not the top down. The complete opposite of everything we understand about saturating a soil. In the A2 horizon, that sandy layer, a really remarkable thing happens. These A2s, they're bleached, they're sandy, they're like going to the beach. And yet, a finger coming through the A horizon 
hits the top of the A2 and spreads out. It spreads out because it's significantly lower hydraulic conductivity than the A1, the layer above it. The opposite of what we think. This is commonly cited to be the hydraulic conduit in these soils. And we get this deep sand, this deep funneling as well, where they form sand infills. In the clays, in the subsoils, one of the remarkable things we see is that only cracks which are hydrologically connected to the fingers actually participate in flow. So a large amount of the porosity in the subsoil actually plays no role in the processes of infiltration. And here you see a finger that's come down from the topsoil, it's hit the top of the clay, it's spread across it, and then it's just flowed, dribbled all the way down the clay columns. So that clay column would have been about that big. Okay. Processes that are well and truly beyond the realms of our mathematical understanding and equations for governing flow in soils. Now, if this works, imagine that you're actually travelling through each soil layer, each soil horizon. If it works, you'll see what I mean. Topsoil, evenly stained. So it's starting to get the fingers developed. Big, prominent finger, where my finger is. Hits the A2, spreads out starts tracking around the A2 and then down the sand infills between the clay columns and then starts welling up through the cracks between the clay columns and then no dive right down at 90 centimetres. Do you want to see it again? Yeah. No. This time I'll shut up. So in the wet soil, what happened? Wet soil, we had this uneven wetting front. Well, hold on. If it's not water repellent, and the structure is fairly even, which it is, in these soils, why did we get this development of wetting front instability? That should have been even infiltration, like you saw in that first slide. And what's more, where did the dye go? That's not 25 millimetres of dye. So we have some real questions about not only when these soils are really dry in the preferential processes, but things aren't going right when they're wet either. When we look at the wet and the dry and we compare the sites, you'll see when it's dry, we get this infiltration between 80 and, 100 and 119 centimetres depth. And those differences in soil morphology and layers and the different types of subsoils, they didn't make a great deal of difference. We see in all of them, except that one, that the majority of the low A horizon was completely bypassed. The top of the B horizon was mostly bypassed and the soil water storage was in this zone between 50 and 80 centimetres depth. Those same soils when wet, we see deeper infiltration into the A horizon, the top soil here, but nothing really gets beyond about 40 centimetres. So it's completely containing those top soils. So it's moisture content not the morphology which is really governing the participation of soil in flow. Quick summary. In dry soil we infiltrated to 80 to 120 centimetres. The infiltration rates measured by wetting, they're actually wetting front velocities, were up to 12,000 millimetres per hour. There were five different forms of finger flow and preferential flow bypassed as much as 99.7% of the upper B horizon. When it was wet, we only infiltrated to 20 to 40 centimetres depth. The infiltration rate was an average of 120 millimetres per hour, still fast, and instability developed in the wetting front. Now we're going to start trying to... Actually, just a couple of implications. Let's be farmers for a moment. What this is showing is when soils are dry, you have almost complete inability to wet up the topsoil with irrigation or rainfall. Okay. Nearly all of the irrigation you applied actually went beneath the, the root zone into the subsoil. I think it ranged between 27 and 86% of the applied irrigation was lost below the root zone. You had very uneven wetting of that topsoil, which causes things like crop unevenness. You have complete inability to use a soil moisture sensor because if you moved it two centimetres to the left, you'd get a totally different reading. 
and fertiliser and, and things like that will be mobilised beneath the root zone. So they've got issues not only for production but for environmental management. When it was wet, we could wet up the topsoil, that was okay. But it was apparent that we were losing quite a bit of the irrigation and quite possibly things like fertiliser and nutrients by lateral flow. And that we had waterlogging at the base of the A1 horizon as shallow as 15 centimetres in the soil. And that's not a good thing either. So it's almost so, so where I move to now is trying to understand what mechanisms and processes actually governed some of those flow conditions. We set up long-term monitoring of soil moisture at quite short intervals at the site with the sand infills. And what we can see from the long-term records is plenty of evidence of preferential flow. So here's the topsoil, and you see for most of the year it didn't even wet beyond 10 10%. And yet even though it only went up to 10%, we had infiltration all the way through to 70 centimetres. But not 30 centimetres. 30 centimetres didn't react. That's because that horizon's been completely bypassed. The infiltration via the rivulets and fingers are routed beyond the sensor area of detection. We end up filling up the soil from the bottom up. And as you see, when it gets wet towards this end of the year, things change. That's actually the true saturated moisture content of these soils, around 40 to 50%. Mm -hmm. This is a sequence of rainfall events after a prolonged dry period. And what we see with the first rainfall event is the only sensor to respond was at 70 centimetres depth. The rainfall quite literally bypassed the whole of the soil profile. The next rainfall event, we see 50 and 70 centimetres respond. That's because it's filled up 70, it's now starting to fill up 50. It's working up the profile. 10 centimetres started to respond. We've started to wet it further down. The next one we see 20 centimetres respond. 70 is full, 50 is still recording. And by the time we get to this fifth rainfall event, we actually see that we have things in the right order. 10 centimetres responded, then 20, and then 30 centimetres. So we finally have the uniform type of infiltration that's actually predicted by Richard's equation in Darcy's law. When we analyse each of those rainfall events, we can classify them in terms of being either preferential from non-sequential response, or the flow rate's too fast, or equilibrium according to Richard's equation. And what we find is that there's no relationship between the occurrence of preferential flow and either the magnitude of rainfall, the intensity of rainfall, either as an average or a maximum. And that contradicts nearly all the literature that exists on the occurrence of preferential flow, which says it occurs once you actually exceed a rainfall intensity. What we did find, not surprisingly, is that there was a significant relationship between soil moisture and the occurrence of preferential flow, at which around this 226, 250 millimetres, or about 70% of the total soil water, Below that, you had infiltration by preferential processes. Above that antecedent moisture content, when the profile was already 70% moist, you had uniform fl flow processes. So we have this switching in how these soils behave according to moisture content. And unfortunately, the story is not as simple as that. So a quick summary. Preferential flow is not related to rainfall magnitude and intensity. Occurrence occurred below a soil moisture threshold. And that we have a very poor relationship between rainfall and the change in soil moisture, which is interesting because that also invalidates the use of most soil water models. And that most of the rainfall events resulted in preferential flow. Preferential flow is the dominant and most common form of infiltration into these soils. We look at the effect of moisture content on hydraulic conductivity, try and understand these things. Flow down here, or the rate of hydraulic conductivity, is through these mesopores. Whereas up here, this is to do with macropores. The difference between them is the macropore contribution to flow. What you see in the A horizon is the complete opposite of everything we expect. We find that the flow rates are lower in the A horizon when they're wet. So once you've overcome water repellents, you expect infiltration rates to increase, but they've actually decreased, particularly the macropore flow component. In the A2 horizon, that sandy layer, again, a very strange thing happens. The flow rate is significantly higher in these mesopores when it's wetter. 
And what that was attributed, the other thing that happens in the A2 is when they're dry, they're really firm and they're cemented and crusty. When they're wet, they actually flow like soup. And what's actually happened is we've got soluble silica being deposited within the mesopause and the micropores between the sand grains. And that's actually slowing the flow rate through them when they're dry until that silica has actually re gone back into solution. In the B2, in the clays, not surprisingly, when they're wet, we get much less macropore flow. That one didn't quite wet up properly compared to when they're dry. And you'll see when they're dry, you get almost no flow through the clay, through the micropores, and then all of a sudden, bang, you've got these big macropores and the water just pours through. But when it's wet, they seal up. They don't completely seal up. We still get actually a reasonable amount of flow through those cracks. And that's because sand has dropped through from the A2 and is lining a lot of those, those clays. So the clays swell. The swelling reduces but doesn't stop the flow through the shrinkage cracks. And the point of this is that none of this is accounted for in any of the equations or understanding of soil physics and the models that we use to simulate water movement in these soils. We don't consider water repellents, silica cementation or clay swelling, and yet they have the dominant control and influence over the hydraulic conductivity, the flow rate of these soils. common understanding of these soils is that you have development of subsurface lateral flows and ponding between the A and B horizons. You can see here when they're dry what happens. The ponding just hits the top of the B, travels a short distance, then pours down the profile. Here's a finger coming down and hitting the B, and again that image. So we don't get lateral flow in dry soil conditions. That's understandable now that we understand the importance of the cracking. But when they're wet, a funny thing happens. Most of the literature says you need a one to two order of magnitude difference in hydraulic conductivity between layers to develop ponding and lateral flow. And what we see here is the difference between the A and the A2, and again the A and the B21, is, I, is less than one order of magnitude in terms of hydraulic conductivity. The point is, the conditions for developing ponding and lateral flow never actually exist in these soils even though it's a sand sitting on top of a clay because of all those other mechanisms we've discussed. So the most common and widely held belief about the hydrology of these soils simply does not hold in the soils that I examined. So what did happen? What happened was we had flow through the A horizon where we don't expect it. See here, this is where I was standing whilst applying the dye to this one and it's travelled underneath this barrier through the A horizon and because I've compacted the soil by standing there it's come up underneath my feet. And in this excavation here we see this water actually flowing above the A2, the sandy layer, within the A1 horizon. And again here. So we do have lateral flow. It's just not occurring where it's predicted to occur from our common understanding or our modelling of soil water movement in these soils. One of the things that proved true was the importance of water repellents. And here's the soil which is collected in summer, and you can see it's so water repellent that the droplets are actually evaporating under the lights over about an eight hour period. What should happen in most normal soils is those droplets infiltrate into the soil as water repellents is broken down over time. So water repellents, we talk about persistence and severity. This is the test of its persistence. So this is off the dial hydrophobicity. We're interested in trying to understand, does water repellent start explaining some of the things we're seeing in these soils? So what I did was I plotted the change in potential water repellents, that's of dried aggregates, over the season. As you see, it goes from zero right up and then starts crashing again in winter. This is one of only two reported cases in the literature where seasonal water repellents actually varies. Every other soil that's water repellent all around the world, once you wet the soil, it loses its repellence, but once it's dry, that water repellence is instantly returned to the soil. That's not the case here. It's completely different. So what I did was I set up a leaching column and I leached with water. And as you can see, the water drop penetration, the persistence of water, water repellents dropped like a bomb with the first one. So what we've got is rainfall leaching 
the soluble water repellent compounds from the soil, particularly the compounds responsible for the persistence of water repellents rather than its physical severity. And that's not been recorded in the literature before. So I set up a hell, hellish short chamber to try and start understanding some of these things. This is the one, that's according to how things should go. When there's airflow at the bottom of the chamber and we've got a dry soil that's wettable, you get even infiltration. You also get even infiltration if the soil's wettable, soaking wet with no air entrapment. So it's not due to moisture content. The same soil, but in its water repellent state, before it was leached by winter rainfall, collected from the same site with no air entrapment, develop these wetting front instabilities like you saw in the dye stain. And the fascinating one was that same wettable soil. It's no longer water repellent. It's wet. It's at field capacity, but with air entrapment, developed the same degree of wetting front instability as what we saw in the wet soil during infiltration. So while we had no explanation for understanding why wetting front instability would develop during infiltration into wet soil, it's apparent that closure or inability to displace existing soil water further down the soil profile has resulted in that instability developing in the A horizon in both dry and wet conditions. And dry conditions due to the water repellents. Okay, let's skip that. So if we start looking at these issues in terms of irrigating or managing these soils, we start looking at what effect it might have on measuring soil moisture. So we take a good probe, a probe like the Enviroscan, it's a metre long, it's got a very wide sensor area, much wider than most other techniques. We position it theoretically over the dye stained images, we move it around and we calculate out the variance and the likelihood of intersecting soil moisture. And what you see is that you've got a very high chance of intersecting a flow path, regardless of what depth you place your sensors or whatever. What you don't have is a large proportion of the sensor area actually wetted. So small differences in the positioning of your sensor will result in very large differences in the amount of recorded soil moisture. So it's effectively useless for irrigation scheduling. And if we look at the variance in this over the theoretical number of probes you need to apply, what it's saying is around this, to reduce your variance by 90%, you're going to need two or three of these probes in a one metre area to get a true measure of soil moisture. Okay. And that this, each one of these kicks is an irrigation event. And one of the other things, due to their water repellents, it can take up to six irrigation events before you actually fill the soil profile. <coughs> You, even though you're supplying excess amount of water with every one, every one we had runoff, every one there was more water supplied than there was pore space to fill in the soil. Okay, so they're very difficult to fill. They take a lot of work and a lot of application. And that the application uniformity was very low, only around 60 to 70 percent. Okay, only seven, 27 to 69 percent of the infiltrated infiltra infiltration was actually retained in the root zone. Most of the water is lost. These findings have fairly significant ramifications for soil water modelling. What I looked at was how parameterisation approach influenced how the models ran. So the two most important pieces of data for soil water models is the soil water retention curve and um, hydraulic conductivity. So I used five different ways of determining um, the soil water retention curve. The traditional one is sorption plates and pressure chambers. That can take six to nine months to get a curve. Using evaporation, I can do similar stuff in about four days. And also inverse solution of infiltration from the dispermiamas, where I run the models backwards to tell me what the parameters should have been for the type of soil moisture response and infiltration that I got. And what you see is complete and utter garbage. You see, this effectively is what a sand looks like. This is more like a clay with absolutely no macropores. And here again, this is like a, a gravel draining compared to a clay with no porosity at all. You see that the, the method chosen for determining these functions so profoundly influenced the results that you got that we now really seriously need to question whether any of these techniques have any validity.
or whether they have validity only under very strict um, setup boundary conditions and moisture content ranges. And this is a real challenge for soil hydrology. Likewise, saturated hydraulic conductivity measured six ways resulted in up to four orders of magnitude difference. And that's because this way of determining hydraulic conductivity really eliminates or minimises preferential flow, whereas this encourages or is able to seek out that effect. Four orders of magnitude difference. And when we run it through the models, here's the measured soil moisture from the Enviroscan probe, and remember it's got some question marks around it. Here's the moisture content, so this is rainfall over a two year period. Here's the rainfall according to the model with each of those five different ways of parameterising the models. So this is using Hydrus, the world's most sophisticated soil water hydrological model. As you can see, it massively overpredicted the moisture content in the A horizon. And likewise, it massively underpredicted the infiltration into the subsoil. So we have complete model failure. So in conclusion, implications for farming. Preferential flow may result in 40% loss of irrigation below the root zone. Wetting up the A1 horizon required up to six irrigation events. Development of waterlogging and subsurface lateral flows is only likely following persistent rainfall at high intensities. It's not a common feature of these soils. You can expect uneven crop growth due to the low application uniformity of the irrigation and that there's potential for surfactants to help overcome the water repellents because we know we can leach water repellents from the soil so we can leach it and then manage it as a normal soil. In terms of agrochemical management, fertiliser and pesticide mobility is likely to be very, very high when soils are dry. That is the opposite to all the recommendations as to when to apply these chemicals, which say apply it to dry soils to minimise the chance of runoff. Okay. Wetting front velocities are really extreme. They're between 212,000 millimetres per hour, so there's no opportunity for microbial breakdown of any of these agrochemicals that might be contained in the soil water. Agrochemicals are likely to be stored at the base of the soil profile until intersected and transported laterally via groundwater. And soil water and pesticide models are simply not able to evaluate or measure the movement of pesticides and agrochemicals in these soils. We have complete model failure. In terms of natural resource management, we get higher drainage than expected or predicted by the models, which presumably means higher salinity risk, groundwater accession, but we have lower leaching of salt that actually exists within the profile because the water is routing around the clay columns, not actually through them. We have much lower than expected irrigation application efficiency, but we also have some evidence of translocation and storage of dissolved organic carbon via the leaching of the water repellents within the soil. So there might be some long-term sinks of carbon in these soils that we wouldn't have expected. In terms of modelling, um, we're throwing the baby out with the bath water. Um, we have no confidence with any of the five parameterisation approaches that we applied. Um, the models simply cannot simulate the types of processes occurring in these soils. Um, they can't simulate either the amounts or the rates of water movement. Um, and that we had considerable overestimation of available soil water in the topsoil and significant underestimation of leaching and movement into the subsoil. Thanks guys. I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors of course, uh, people that helped me with field work, um, funding from the SURF uh, Landscape Logic Hub and um, to Peewee who provided my secondment to do my PhD.